The, the title of the message this morning is The Good News. And um, I've a- actually added a, a question mark at the end of it. And the reason I did that, because it, it's not, isn't it good news, or is there a question about the good news? It's because a- as a Christian, sometimes I found myself um, saying, if it's that good a news, why aren't I sharing it more? If, if it's really that good a news, why am I apprehensive in, in sharing it? Um, and the question is, if it's such good news, why, why am I, we, sometimes uneasy, nervous, fearful, even maybe ashamed at, at sharing the gospel, the story of Jesus? We, we're here because we're saved, right? We're here, we accepted the good news. And so I want to look at the good news. I want to look at what it is in in its entirety, in in its power. And we also want to look at a man and the effect that the good news had on him. So the the word news, I've heard, um, you know, it has different origins. But one that I like is it's an acronym, North, East, West, and South. So it's information coming from the four directions and the, the definition of news is information that was not previously known. So it's, it's something unknown or new to you, right? So just taking that concept in, in um, this information, uh, we have a lot of bad news. We, we watch, you know, TV, we hear news of wars and, and taxes and, you know, it's a lot of bad news. What we need is good news. We need news that brings some hope some joy, some peace, all right? So, yeah, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your good news. Thank you for this, this church, this group, this, this body called Tribes. Thank you for the building that we're enjoying. Thank you for your provision. Thank you that you are our Lord, that you do not change. Your promises are so abundant and so... We invite you here this morning, Holy Spirit, to teach us, to guide us, to open our eyes and our ears, that we can truly understand what your good news is and the effect it has on our lives. And we ask all of this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right. All right. Is this good? Okay. So the good news... um, I want to look at a famous man who discovered the good news. His name was Paul, or it started off as Saul in the Bible, changed to Paul. But this guy was, you, you'll understand, he's, he was a legend. A little bit of background on him. He was born roughly the same time as Jesus, so he knew who Jesus was. He was born, um, some scholars say, 5 AD to 5 BC, so he may have been a few years older or younger than Jesus. Um, he, was bought, he was known as Saul of Tarsus. Now, Tarsus is a city up in southern Turkey in a region of Cilicia. So he was born um, in Turkey, but he was a, totally a Jew. He was a Jew, but also a Roman citizen. And that becomes important a little later on. Um, we do have a visual. Uh, there was a, a historian called Onesiphorus who wrote a a quick snapshot of what Paul looked like. And I'll I'll read it to you. He said that Paul was a man small of stature, with a bald head and crooked legs. (laughs) He had a good state of body with eyebrows meeting. I guess he had a unibrow. (laughs) His nose was somewhat hooked, that he was full of friendliness, and for now he appeared like a man and has the face of an angel. What a, what a description to, to say he had the face of an angel. Now, he might, you might be thinking of um, the penguin in the Batman movie, but just a kind of version, right? That's maybe what Paul looked like. God will use anyone. And, you know, just knowing that Paul had bow legs, you know, he was a little fella. But in, in truth, it's estimated that on all his missionary trips, he walked roughly 16,000 kilometers. So those little legs carried him all, all over Asia, Greece, everywhere, sharing the gospel. So, yeah, I find encouragement in that. By age 21, 
Paul had earned the equivalent of two advanced academic degrees. He studied under a, a chap called Gamaliel, um, who was one of the leading thinkers of the time. So Paul was up there. He was a, he was a bright spark. Um, he was also a Pharisee. Now, we read of Pharisees in the Bible. There was contention between the Pharisees and Jesus. Jesus had some harsh words against the Pharisees. The Pharisees were zealous for the law. Now, early on the Old Covenant, the law was what, what was given to the Jews to live by, and there was a lot of law. It was almost impossible to keep the law just by virtue of how much there was. And actually, if you visit Israel today, they still hold fast to the law. For example, on the Sabbath, um, you can't turn the tap on to wash your hands in the bathroom, so you have to have water there so you can just dip your hands in. So it's, it's kind of rigid, and to look at the law and then look at Paul and his, he says at one point, and we'll read that a little bit later on, he says, in regard to the law, I was blameless. So he upheld the law. That was his value. That was his standard, what, what kept him going. Um, so the, the contention arises between Jesus, right, who's bringing a new covenant, and the Pharisees. Je Jesus came bringing the Holy Spirit, the salvation to not only the Jews but the Gentiles, and salvation not by works or law but by accepting Jesus' lordship and his death and resurrection, right? So his, his sacrifice by dying. So there was this contention between Paul, the Pharisees, saying, no, it's the law, it's the law, this is how we're saved. And Jesus saying, yes. Um, it, actually, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So Jesus He's the author of all this anyway. He started it. He's well aware of the law, but he's bringing a new covenant of salvation to everybody. So that, that's the, the reason why the, there is contention here between, between the Pharisees. Because Paul was a very devout Pharisee, he acted against what, what was known as the way. Now, the way was the early church. That, that's what it was called. Um, and he persecuted, imprisoned, and even was part of the death, the stoning death of a fellow called Stephen. Stephen was a Christian who was full of faith, full of power, just did amazing things and was unfortunately stoned to death. And Paul, the Bible says, held the garments of those people who were stoning him and watched it all happen. Now, that's important because I'm, I'm kind of building a little bit of a picture here of, of who Paul was. I will just call him Paul because Saul was uh, his old name. We know him better by, by Paul. So Paul may have even sat with the Sanhedrin at the trial of Jesus. We don't know a lot, but we know that he was there. He knew who Jesus was. Jesus knew who Paul was. Yeah, okay. Paul later refers to himself as, as a bad man, a terrible man in his pre-Christian endeavours, Right? Um, before he became a Christian, and even after his, his conversion, he was aware of his sinful nature. In Romans, he says, oh, what a sinful man I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? So ever aware of, of his sinfulness and the price that Jesus paid that he could be set free. So I'm building here on the story of Paul and his conversion an understanding of the good news. So come with me on this, on this journey. Um, Paul, in his zeal, was not only content to persecute the Christians in Jerusalem, but he'd also got a letter from the, the chief priest in Damascus. Now, Damascus is up in Syria. It's still there today. You might have heard it, about it in the news. It actually plays into the end times as well. So Damascus is a city... And Paul had got a letter. He was going to go not on like a missionary trip. He was going to do a persecution trip. You know, let's go and round up some Jews and we'll drag them back to Jerusalem and, you know, teach them a lesson, those beggars. Um, Damascus, like I said, is a city still in existence today. Um, it was on this journey, just as he got to Damascus, it was here 
that everything changed for Paul. It, yeah. It was here that he encountered the power, the power and the authority of Jesus. Now, he'd known Jesus as a man, but now he's going to meet him in a different way. And this was awesome for me because reading through this and studying Roman, uh, sorry, Acts was, was epic. The, the, the Bible, we're, we're going to read some more of it um, in a minute, but it is so packed with information and secrets and revelation and aha moments. And it's like, my gosh, yeah. All right, we'll read a bit more of that in a minute. Um, so it was here on, on the road to Damascus that he would shift from being probably the Christian's biggest human enemy to now possibly one of the greatest evangelists that the world has ever seen. And he went on to write roughly a quarter of the New Testament. So that's, that's a big feat. Let's take our Bibles out and turn to um, Acts chapter 9 verse 1. Okay, you all there? Okay, so it's a little bit to read, but I, I really want to focus on this because as we read through the Bible, this is the Word of God. It's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It has the power to transform and renew our minds, right? That's what we have in our hands. So let's read it together. Um, chapter 9, verse 1. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and he asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that he, if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound in to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly, I like that word, suddenly, a light shone around him, and from heaven he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless. They heard a voice, but saw no one. Then Saul arose from the ground. When he opened his eyes, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand, brought him to Damascus, and he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now, there was a certain man, certain disciple at Damascus called Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight, Straight Street, and inquire at the house of Judas for the one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Ananias answered, no, Lord. No, he didn't say that. He said, Lord, I've heard, heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. The Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way, entered the house, laying his hands on him. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once. He arose and was baptized. 
So, when he had received food, he was strengthened, and Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Right, two more verses. Immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues that, that he is the Son of God, and all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on his name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Right, there's a lot there. Um, and I, it was important to read it because there's a lot of nuggets, a lot of nuggets in that. One was that, that um, stuck out to me. It was Jesus said, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, you're probably wondering what a goad is. When in, in the early days when they um, drove cattle, they would have a, a sharp stick called a goad that they would use to, to give the cattle a bit of a push in the back. So it was kind of like a, a you know, a, a hurry up and move along. So kicking against a sharp stick would be something that was counterproductive and painful. And, and that's the, the image here that Paul was doing. He was resisting Christ and it was hurting him. Now, Paul, Paul was using the law as his, his foundation. He was using that. That was his hope. That was, you know, what he was relying on. So now he's being confronted with something different. The other thing um, was when Jesus said, Saul, Saul. There's only a couple of times where, where a name is repeated, and it's usually in a time of commissioning. So it's an important time here. Um, and the other amazing thing to me is that we know that to receive the Lord, you, you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart. And this is exactly what happened at that split second when Jesus appeared to him and he said, who are you, Lord? Because in, in his, all of his thinking, it finally clicks. He realizes this is Lord, this is God, this Jesus. And he accepts him. Who are you, Lord? I'll do whatever you want me to do. So it's a very, very, um, yeah, that leads me to my second point exactly that I, it's called, didn't see that coming. And I'm sure Paul was right there saying, my gosh, I came here to persecute. And then all of a sudden, I, I, I'm stopped dead in my tracks and I am turning about face 180 degrees and, and going the opposite way in, in my thinking and my purpose. So we know also that it was midday. Paul says later on in Acts 22, 6, that it was around noon. So the sun was really bright and then a light from heaven. So it was really a, a miraculous occur, occurrence, right? Paul was blinded. He fell down. Um, when he opened his eyes, he couldn't see. So so that sets that up. The, the awesome thing, too, was that God appears to Ananias and says, hey, go and find Saul. And he appears to Saul and says, Ananias is coming to restore your sight. And he let him sit there for three days. That's, you know, it seems to be a, 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 a reoccurring thing in the Bible. You know, Jesus died for three days. There's a lot of three-day things. But Saul sat there blind, didn't eat didn't drink. And also when he did, when he got his, his sight back, he didn't rush out and have something to eat and drink. He went and got baptized first and then ate and drank and got his strength. So we see a totally different Saul here. I see, I, you know, as I said, when he says, Lord, that was the pivot point. That was the change. And in that moment, um, everything fit together. It all made sense, the good news, the way, the love, joy, the peace that he'd seen in the people he'd persecuted, the faith that they had, the strength of Stephen, Stephen being stoned to raise his eyes and say, um, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So Paul saw that and he's probably thinking, what is he talking about and why you know, he, 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 know, he, he observed Christians. And the Bible said you will know they're Christians by their love. 
So he, he experienced this love. He saw the fruit of the Spirit in the people he's persecuting. And then he sees Stephen dying, saying, I see Jesus at the right hand of God. Well, that's putting him equal with God. So this is, it all made sense. He understood this Jesus who had healed people, worked miracles, cast out demons, walked on water, um, was now standing at the right hand of God. And so this is now his Lord. This, this is his Jesus. And so what an amazing revelation. His eyes were opened. He finally understood. And to me, that, that blew me away. Um, Philippians 3. I have another verse here I want you to read with me. So Philippians 3, um, right in the middle of verse 3. Um, who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Now, Paul here is talking about the flesh. He's, he's kind of bragging on who he was as a man, his upbringing. Um, but he, he had good bragging rights. He really did. Um, let's read on. I have no confidence in the flesh, verse 4, though I might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. He says in verse 5, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Concerning the law, mate, I was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So he's got it down. The, you know, Paul is bragging on himself, and he was. He was an amazing guy. Verse 7, he says, But, but, what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I might gain, might gain Christ. Hmm. So Paul is converted. He's he's saved. Yeah. Wait, this, this changes because he's affected so many people, his conversion, right? Um, he confesses, Lord, what do you want me to do? He believes that, that Jesus is God. He has just met God. Uh, we're told that he fasts and prays, as I said, for three days, receives his sight, gets baptised, and then he, he eats and drinks, and then straight out to preach in the synagogues. He's unstoppable. And, and I want you to read, um, I can't do it now, but I want you to write down, if you're taking notes, 2 Corinthians 11, that whole chapter, because Paul talks about the things that he's gone through for the, for the gospel. He's, he's whipped. His back is, is literally opened up by being scourged. He is shipwrecked. He is stoned. He is actually stoned to death. And they pray for him. He comes back to life. He says, I saw heaven. And then he turns around and goes straight back in to keep preaching <laughs> the people that stoned him. So he, he's a legend. He goes on to live an extraordinary life. Um, as I said, write it down. Go home and read about, read about Paul. Be, be amazed. Be impressed because I am impressed. And, and here's the takeaway he is, he is only one of the few people in the Bible who says, imitate me. I, I'll, I imitate Christ. The, the word says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So he is saying, look at me as a role model. I don't look at like, you know, who I think I was wonderful. I'm only wonderful because of, and he doesn't even say he's wonderful, but he's following Christ right? That's his salvation. That's his new value. So 
Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Yeah. I really need that. I need a role model. I need a Lord. I need somebody bigger than me who's got it sorted out, who can take care of Murray, who has a plan for Murray, who has a hope. He, he's, he's made promises. And it's up to us, church. We need to read the Bible, find out what the promises are, stand on the promises. This is awesome, you know, and then to be salt and light, to take that out to the world. I want, I want fires to light in each one of us that when we go out, we will light fires in other people, yeah? So the last point is, is the good news really good news? And that brings me back to my first point is if it is really good news, why am I apprehensive sometimes in sharing it? Now, there's nothing wrong with being nervous or timid or even afraid of sharing the gospel. There's, there's a passage in the New Testament where Paul said, I was terrified, I was shaking. And not because he was scared, but because the gospel is a simple message that in, in this case, it, it appeared to be foolishness, right? Right? We want to go out, we want to convince people how wise we are and how we've got, you know, a new take on something and how clever our argument is. The gospel is not that. It's a simple message that appears foolishness, but that's the, that's the beauty of it. It's where God works, it's not Murray working. It's God working and, and we, our mandate is to go and share it. Jesus, God gave us a couple of commands. One is to go into all the world and make disciples, right? We go out and share the gospel. And sometimes it's, it should just be a cut and dry thing, an easy thing. Just, just do it. Don't argue about it. Is the good news really good news? Well, what determines the, you know, the urgency of the news is, is maybe the magnitude of the news. Is it big news? The implications? Um, and, and for example, the implications, it, you need to act. Say we just got a ping on our phone saying there's a, a tsunami headed towards Perth. Um, you better get up the top of Green Mount Hill uh, in 45 minutes or you'll be, um, you know, inundated with water and drown. We'd all be out the door because there is, a, you know, urgency in the news, right? We, we need to act. Some news is pretty mundane. You know, oh, we got a new footpath uh, down in Perth and, you know, it's ma it looks really good. Well, it doesn't really affect me and it's not really urgent. So some news is more impending than others. Um, and also we need to look at the source of the news. Yeah, in this case, it's a trustworthy source. This is Almighty God, the author of life. And so the gospel then, the good news has magnitude, it has implication, it has a trustworthy source. And so we need a Lord. That's my conclusion. Paul needed a Lord. His Lord was his, his law, and it shifted to Jesus. And he realized, mate, this guy, I can trust him. He's not going to back down. Uh, we've been lied to by so many people, and we need someone we, we can trust. Australians need someone we can trust. And I submit to you, it's Jesus. It's Almighty God and the Word of God. So those who have it all and think that they don't need Jesus, I, I want to challenge that and say, um, you're looking in the wrong place, right? We look at, at the house, the money, the car, the job, what we wear and how we look. Jesus has a different currency, and that currency is love. You can't buy love. It's peace. Peace is something that we all want, world peace, but only Jesus can bring peace. And Philippians says, the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's the peace I want. Yeah, I want a peace that, that will protect me. Joy. We want joy. We, we want that, that, that attribute that is not, not swayed by emotion or situation. We want joy. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. I want to be strong. I don't want to be weak, always falling down. Wow, 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 you know, poor me. Hope. Hope is a huge one. And hope is, is looking forward to something. Whether we have short-term hope, 
of like, oh, we're, we're going out tonight or we have, we're going on a vacation in a month or we're going to spend eternity with Jesus. Hope is so important. If we have hope, the Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick. Again, the good news is all of these things, love, joy, peace, hope, forgiveness. We're all sinful. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We all need to be saved. And Jesus says, I, I've died for all your sins. I, was, I will forgive you. And then abundant life. And there are so many here, but I'm just stopping here. with Abundant life is all the attributes of life amplified. And I look around us here and we, we have abundance here. Look at all the faces and the joy. It's like, wow, this is the fruit of knowing Christ. So the good news is a gift from God. It is the forgiveness of our sins, of which death is, is the penalty. It's the promise of eternal life. It's the promise of abundant life. It's the promise of the Holy Spirit, the most powerful force in the universe living inside us, teaching and guiding us. And so, having said all that, if you've accepted the good news, that's awesome. If, if you're here and you, if you haven't, why not? It's, it's an offer, a free offer for everyone. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your good news. Thank you that you care about us. Um, that you have a plan for us. Thank you that you love us, Lord. I thank you for the, those who, who have accepted your, your gift of eternal life, of the good news, Lord. I also just want to pray that for those who haven't accepted. And if you, if you need to make your peace with Jesus, if you need to accept him as your Lord, it's simple. You, you say, Lord, I need help. I believe you and I need help. I need, need to change my direction. So if that's you, then... Yeah, it's time to get, time to make that choice. Why don't we all stand and we'll, we'll sing.